Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 10, 10 DLC webinar. Uh, we're excited to have everybody on the event today right across the political community. We're joined by hundreds of industry leaders on this call. And we know how busy you all are, and we appreciate you taking the time to participate in this important subject. We, we respect your time. We're going to move through the event today um, quite quickly. And we all have something in common here today. Uh, 10 DLC rules affect all of us. So we're happy to get together each month to discuss the latest developments. And we also appreciate seeing the process continually evolve based on feedback from the industry. As you may know, Peerly is a national provider of peer-to-peer -peer texting, and our organization is not political, but our software is used heavily throughout the political industry, and we do transact billions of messages each year. Peerly, like many of you, has had to navigate 10 DLC, um, and throughout this process, we've garnered a lot of knowledge along the way. So webinars like this are a way for us to pass on this knowledge to our community. We've assembled a group of some of the top experts in the industry on 10 DLC for today's call, and they are joining us to provide an update and to answer your questions. We encourage everybody to get involved and to ask questions today by typing them in below. And if you need anything clarified, um, we're happy to address this. This is the perfect time to do it. So you just put it in the question box and we'll be happy to clarify this and uh, call on one of our experts to do that. I would like to make some quick introductions before handing this off and getting started. I think that um, Stefan from the campaign uh, registry is running a couple of minutes late, but he'll be joining us in a few minutes as well. Uh, but first, let me introduce um, the VP of Peerly, Dan Aquila. Dan is an expert on 10 DLC messaging, and Dan and his team oversaw the implementation of the 10 DLC process with hundreds of political accounts here at Peerly. Dan has fully automated this process to benefit his clients and to streamline the registration. And he's been involved in high level international and domestic um, telephony for probably, I guess, uh, over 17 years now, Dan. Um, he has close relationships with all the major carriers, DCAs and tax aggregators. And he's worked with government regulators in Canada and the UK consulting on similar messaging registries designed for campaigns and service providers. So he brings uh, quite a bit of experience uh, to us today. And we are happy uh, to have Stefan that will be joining us uh, today. As I said, he should hopefully be popping on any moment um, with the campaign registry. Uh, of course, the campaign registry is responsible for administering the 10 DLC registration. Stefan and his team has always went above and beyond throughout the rollout process and they've been a great resource for the political industry. The campaign registry continues to bring improvements to the process based on industry recommendations. We all appreciate that. Um, and um, we're, we're happy to welcome uh, Stefan back um, to, uh, to the call today. We have uh, John from Aegis Mobile on the line. Welcome back, John. Of course, Aegis is um, an official vetting partner for the campaign registry. They play a massive role behind the scenes when it comes to vetting organizations. Peerly has been always thoroughly impressed with how Aegis um, leverages their um, technology to make the vetting process as seamless as possible. And we're really looking forward to hearing uh, from you today, John. So thanks for being here. Uh, Jonathan from Cinch, um, welcome back. We appreciate you being here. Of course, he is the director of US products at Cinch. And Cinch is a leading global communications platform as a service provider. And their cloud messaging platform handles over 145 billion messages globally um, each year. John has decades of experience. He brings an impressive amount of knowledge to the table. And we're happy you're able to join us again, John. Um, thank you. Uh, Stephanie from Bandwidth is with us. Uh, everybody knows Stephanie. Um, if you don't, uh, she's the Senior Director of Product Management at Bandwidth. Bandwidth, of course, is the leading provider of SMS and telephony solutions on an enterprise level. Stephanie is one of the top experts in this field. Uh, she brings amazing insight on 10 DLC. Uh, she always makes a point. Uh, to take time away from a busy schedule to do these events and help um, ben which benefit the political industry and also to help people navigate 10 DLC. So we, we always appreciate that, Stephanie, and we're looking forward to hearing from, uh, from you today as well. 
We have Zachary on the line as well from, um, from Calera. Zachary is the Senior Director at Calera, and Calera um, is the global leader, leader in omni-channel business communications. Uh, they transact tens of billions of SMS and voice messages each year. Uh, they've always had that goal of being able to bridge gaps between businesses and their customers through their communication tools and have been very, very successful at this. Uh, Zachary has been kind enough to lend his time today and his expertise on the 10 DLC process and uh, really how Calera has approached this initiative. We're quite, uh, we're quite happy to hear about. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Dan just to give us a quick 10 DLC overview, and uh, then from there we can hand this off over to John, or if Stefan has uh, has been able to join us at that point, we can hand it off to Stefan, um, just to provide uh, provide an update on um, some of the things that are happening right now in 10 DLC concerning the political industry. Uh, Dan, please go ahead. Yes, thanks, Josh, and I also want to thank everyone for joining us for another purely 10 DLC webinar today. I especially want to thank our panelists for joining us. We hear time and time again from the local industry how much they appreciate the information on 10 DLC that you provide. We have some updates on how the registration process is changing that will be important for the summer and fall busy season. And we want to share those with you today as well. If at any time you have a question, just click the Q&A button like Josh said and get it submitted and we'll answer it later on in the webinar. Um, so to start, to give everyone a quick background on what 10 DLC is for anyone who's joining that, uh, that doesn't know yet, it's an initiative by the mobile phone companies to reduce nuisance text messaging and to stop phishing and fraudulent messages. This is an industry-led response to subscriber complaints. However, it was not mandated by the FCC, FTC, or any other government agency or regulatory group. The mobile phone companies believe that by enacting 10 DLC registration, they will be able to stop the bad actors that cause so many of the complaints that they deal with on a daily basis. And it should allow the phone companies to trust that the messages that we are sending to our political voters are authentic. At the end of the day, it should mean that voters get way fewer spam messages and that our verified messages get a lot more of their attention. Now there's, there's talk in the industry that 10 DLC doesn't apply to politics or that it's not yet required or that the mobile phone companies are gonna stop trying and enforcing it, but that, that's simply not true. It's here to stay. Over the past few months, we've worked through the transition process. There's been a few bumps on the road here and there, but overall, the process has been relatively smooth and in almost all cases, registered SMS messages have experienced good delivery rates with little blocking. We always have a lot of questions around the campaign verify vetting process as it seems to be one of the more complicated steps in the process. We've been passing these concerns on and last month we were happy to announce that soon there'll be an updated process for political campaigns and PACs to get verified. It's streamlined, it's faster, and it's much easier. John and Stefan will explain the details to us in a little bit, but soon you'll be able to complete the whole process right inside the Peerly platform without having to sign up for Campaign Verify separately as you currently do. Now, John and Stefan, we know your organizations have been working extremely hard in this for the past few months. Stefan's gonna be joining us in a little bit, but, but John, I wanna pass the call over to you so you can take us through the improvements that this is gonna mean for political campaign vetting and hopefully ease some of the pain points that have been, been happening, as well as just a general update from Aegis on how the 10 DLC process is going for you. Sure. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so we are happy to announce that uh, as of the end of April, we were able to launch integrated political verification uh, within the registration platform. Uh, that was a pretty significant uh, integrated effort between TCR and ourselves. Um, the the whole idea the the what what caused that to happen really was that the carriers did notice um, some dissension in the ranks, uh, some some complaints um, about the way the process was working, and that people had no choice. They had they had only one way to get political verification. So the carriers asked TCR and Aegis if we would create an alternative. Uh, this was not to supplant what was already being done, but just to give uh, political entities a choice uh, of how to get verified. So we put together a process that uh, observes all the same security precautions and concerns that you know surrounding 
political vetting or political verification, but allows that process to happen in one step. So when you go to register with TCR, which you have to do anyway, uh, you can select that you're going for political verification and you'll be asked for a few more fields, but you don't have to enter all of your information all over again. And what we're mainly collecting in addition to the normal registration information is the specific data that, that reflects what is found in your official governmental political registration, wh whoever you, whatever electoral authority you register with. So we're collecting where you're registered, how you're registered, uh, a lot of the details, pertinent details that are on that registration form so that we can then go back through independent sources, independent authoritative sources and verify all of the registration details. Um, a, a further step, there, there's a lot of concerns about uh, election security. And so we have to abide by a lot of the uh, election security provisions. There is actually a US Senate committee that is very concerned with how this is being done. And, and they're certainly interested in how this verification is happening. So uh, while it may seem that we're being, you know, there's maybe a little overkill or that it's it's painful to do, it's really all being done in the interest of trying to uh, maintain uh, the, the integrity of the political process and, and to make sure that there's not unauthorized messaging going out in that space. Um, so because of that, uh, in addition to us comparing all of the information, we have to perform a step, uh, a, a kind of a 2FA step of, of reaching out directly to the political entity and making them verify a PIN. Uh, so we once you actually pass through all the steps and we verify that all of your information has matched up, we then have to uh, send a pin letter to directly to the political entity. Um, and there are restrictions on on how and where we can send, but generally the options are email if if the email address meets certain requirements. Um, USPS, first class mail which I know everybody gets frustrated with. In fact, we've seen that taking under a week and in, in many times as, as few as three, three days to get a letter through the mail. But we are also offering an express option through FedEx. Uh, so you can get an overnight FedEx of your PIN verification letter. The step that some uh, entities so far have, have not quite grasped is that their political verification isn't complete until they complete the PIN verification process. So what, the way we have implemented that, and I think it's fairly consistent with the way Campaign Verify has done it, is that you receive a letter through one of those methods, and that letter gives you the instructions of, of how to log in and, and verify your PIN. Uh, specifically, we provide both a, a URL, a web URL for you uh, to, to visit to do the PIN verification, and we also provide um, a QR code if you prefer to do that. So you can do this from your mobile device and, and you don't have to enter in a lot of extra information, but you will still have to in, uh, enter your PIN. And, and then once that is verified in the background, uh, we automatically upgrade your uh, status to verified for political. Um, in the event there are issues, uh, we, we uh, will provide feedback back through the registry interface and, and we provide them with information about what had, had problems. Now, we have the ability to make minor corrections. If you have typos in there, things like that, we have the ability to log minor corrections to the information. But if there are significant things that it, it simply doesn't match, we're looking for corrections. And so we have implemented two processes to allow you to resolve those. Um, you, you can, if you feel that all the information is indeed correct and we missed something, you have always have the ability to appeal for free. And you can do that, uh, you know, TCR provides mechanisms for you to do that. Right now, I believe they'll have you reach out to us through our appeals email and we're in the process of putting something into the system that will allow you to click a button to do the same. Um, but uh, if, if you have questions about why there was a problem, why there was a failure, um, there, there is always the opportunity to reach out and get further clarification to what those messages that came back mean. Um, and so this, this whole political verification process, because of the nature of it, and because it's not only for federal, but it's also for state, local, and tribal, um, in a lot of cases, there are no automated resources for being able to do these checks. 
So please understand that this is at this point a, a manual process. It had to be manual in order to launch it that quickly. We put this in place in a, the space of about four weeks from, from start to launch. Um, so it was a very quick process. We are working on the ability to automate pieces of it uh, to make turnaround a little bit quicker and to handle higher uh, volumes. Um, but uh, you know that every time we touch the record, it, it is labor on our part and, and we're staffing up and, and doing all of the, uh, the technology as well to try to make it faster, smoother and, and easier. I'll be happy to entertain any questions on the process. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some. Um, one other point of that, of course, is that there's there's going to be some fees associated with that. Uh, they'll be handled and processed through the Peerly platform. I know John John isn't isn't uh, in a position to speak to those particularly today, but we will have more information that we'll be passing to our users exactly on the, how that's going to work. Um, and the, the FedEx thing is a very, very big, important point. I know that we've had a lot of customers who've been waiting a long time for, for CV tokens through, through the mail process, but this FedEx process, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but hopefully under normal busy situations with a, you know, a, a good registration with good info, because obviously good info is key to a fast registration, but you should see somewhere in the order, you know, next business day or the business day after that, before you get uh, a FedEx to you with your pin code, correct? That, that's correct. And, and I will, um, even though I would, uh, I'd prefer that uh, Stefan speak to charges and you can handle that through your process, I want to ensure you that uh, when we added the Express, the FedEx um, uh, capability, that is the, the, the premium for that is simply the market price of FedEx. You can mm -hmm. look it up mm -hmm. and see what FedEx charges to get it from point A to point B in the US. And, and that's what it is. So there, there's no, there's no um, surcharge on that. So that that's going to be very important for, for political campaigns. You know, one thing that we've always, you know, made it clear to political campaigns is, you know, register as early as possible. Don't leave this to the last minute. Um, I know that some of you are going to, uh, this does help with that process. At least you don't have to wait potentially a week for a, a letter mail to come in. Um, John, there was another topic that we got a lot of questions around, of course, is 501c3s and 501c4s. Um, mm -hmm. Last month, there was a change that allowed recently formed nonprofits to register. And from our point of view, it's been working really, really well. Uh, can you give us an update on that from Aegis's perspective? Uh, nothing new really on that. We are, um, we, we are accepting the application forms, especially if the IRS has acknowledged, um, you know, that, that really helps us make sure that uh, it is a registered nonprofit. If, if we don't have definitive evidence that that process is in place, unfortunately, we still can't, um, you know, honor that we are, we are held to make sure that whoever we are qualifying for nonprofit status is uh, at least officially going through the process with the IRS, preferably has completed the process. We have seen a few that have come through saying, you know, we intend to become a 501c3. We're thinking about doing it. Uh, we're, we're currently a nonprofit with the state and we're thinking about going federal. I'm sorry, you know, understand the situation, but that's something we, we just can't honor at this point. So we continue to go down that path. Uh, we are also working with the carriers to expand or, or at least explore the uh, acceptability of expanding some of the criteria uh, and, and coming up with what we need to be able to cover their cases. Uh, you know, they're, they're concerned about um, their finances and their legality and you know, et cetera, et cetera, deductibility of, of what essentially amounts to donating messaging. Um, so they need to make sure that all of that is covered. So there are some situations with 501c3s, for example, small churches that don't independently register, making sure that we can collect appropriate documentation that says that they are, that certifies that they're operating as a 501c3. So there are still some open points we continue to pursue with the carriers. It really all comes down to what the carriers are willing to accept uh, in those cases, but, but we do continue to push those. Great. Well, thanks a lot uh, for that, uh, John and, and Dan. Um, I, that that's great news on the vetting changes. Um, last month, when you when you mentioned that uh, originally, John, I mean, I felt that, that was a major announcement for the industry. 
Um, clearly, it's going to save time and costs for the political community. And Aegis is an excellent choice to um, bring on for that initiative. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's great. That's going to benefit the political community uh, quite a bit. Um, I would like to pass this over to Stephanie with, um, with bandwidth. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for, uh, for, for being back again today. Um, Stephanie, could you just provide us maybe an update on how the 10 DLC rollout is going with bandwidth and anything that um, is interesting that you're hearing from the carriers? I know it's a big part of your, uh, your position is dealing with, uh, dealing with your carriers on a regular basis, but anything that'd be helpful for the audience? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for having me back. Um, bandwidth is, is, as you know, one of the largest in DLC providers in the messaging space. Um, however, I think uh, we're all learning as we go with this rollout. And um, I think we continue to see high numbers of registrations, which we're very pleased with. Um, you know, there, are, there have been a, a few changes to the process or to uh, certain use cases. Um, and so we're just kind of going with the flow and trying to help um, educate our customers on those changes and how to navigate um, everything that's going on. Um, I think we've we've seen a, we've seen a positive uptake in registration, especially since um, since T-Mobile's announcement in March and the increase in surcharges. So I would just say that overall. Um, we're having a positive experience across the board. I think that um, we're trying to help our customers as best we can navigate. Um, as far as industry updates or things we're hearing from the carriers, um, I think it was it was mentioned by John, but you know, each of the carriers are looking at capacity. I think as we get deeper into this election year. Um, and really looking at uh, the volumes that are forecasted through the summer and then through the end of the year, I think um, that information is, is making its way to the carriers and they are looking at how to increase capacity on their, on their MMSCs and SMSCs and um, looking at ways to make sure that good wanted traffic is successfully delivered. Um, so I think that's a that's a positive um, item that's happening with the with the carriers. Um, again, I think you know we're all learning as we go, and um, I think the carriers are making modifications and um, making changes based on what they're hearing from the industry and from customers and CSPs and DCAs. Um, so. I, uh, I'm interested to see how things go through this summer and um, definitely through the end of the year. Great, uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. And Stephanie makes a great point about, um, about capacity projections and uh, Cineverse on uh, last month's call also mentioned, uh, mentioned that as well. And we're hearing that from, um, from a number of our uh, carriers and DCAs. So, um, I think we have a lot of um, campaign service providers on this call today. So a good takeaway would be that the carriers are really looking for us to do a better job in providing our projections. And I know it's difficult, especially in the political season, but it means that we need to work a little bit closer with our clients to get them those projections, especially when we're looking at MMS or we're looking at things that have uh, finite uh, speed and capacity out there. Uh, due to increased file size. Um, so uh, Stephanie will we'll absolutely put a lot more emphasis on that for, um, um, for uh, yourself and for the DCAs this year, but appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I'd like to pass this over to Jonathan from Cinch. Uh, Jonathan, welcome back. Thanks for being uh, with us again. Um, we'd love to hear your perspective on the 10 DLC rollout and how Cinch has approached the rollout, as well as I know you are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this stuff. Um, anything else you'd like to add or that'd be helpful to our audience? We always appreciate hearing from you, Jonathan. Sure. Thanks, Josh. Um, there's been a lot going on. So 10 DLC keeps us all really busy. So I think I'll start out with some, some general news here. 
about 10 DLC, some focused on political and then some of the challenges we're seeing. So uh, we've got some deadlines coming up with T-Mobile, um, some new fees that are, that are coming down the pike. So uh, the number pool has meant, uh, and again, another uptick in campaign submissions and especially anything that requires a pool of numbers. So lots of businesses do require this. And you, as you know, we, we sell to um, small, medium business. We sell to resellers. We have a huge reseller market with our IntelliQuint um, acquisition. And then we've got, you know, strategic and stuff. So I think if you look at it, um, if you look at how that this has impacted them, our resellers have certainly grown there where they, they require this. So there is a race, so to speak, to get these campaigns filed before the fees kick in. Um, and it, it has caused some, some pain points on the APIs. They've gotten busy in some cases. We had to retry some of these, but I think that's just the nature of, of there is a lot of complexity to file a campaign. So using the APIs mean um, as, as, as we, we're all using the same pipeline essentially to get these provisioned, it's been, it's been uh, some work. Um, yeah, uh, there's some, some other good news on, on uh, the carrier front for, uh, for campaign uh, and TPS resizing, both SMS and MMS. As, as um, Stephanie noted, uh, one of the big markers that uh, we've heard from, from AT&T is that they're, they're going to look to improve this and accommodate that. And uh, the hope is, is June, but it could be, you know, this is a lot of work to be able to do this. But what this means is, is to resize 10 DLC to, to uh, in my opinion, uh, provide a, uh, an MMX experience similar to what you get with toll free and short code today. So across the board, allowing more throughput. Right now we've got some, uh, some challenges with uh, sender and recipient based um, throttling. And Cinch has done, done quite a bit of workarounds initially to accommodate that. But that, that really just means a lot of fixes on the front end to, to address um, deficiencies on the back end. So with this, um, we're hoping to see uh, with, a, with a, I would expect a soft rollout and then a hard rollout, much improved uh, TPS as we go towards the election season on, um, on you know, messages per second and capabilities, both file sizes and supported um, file types um, with, uh, with AT&T. Um, also some improvements, and I'm not gonna steal TCR's thunder, but uh, improvements with visibility. Uh, there's new categories there that, that don't just impact uh, they don't impact political, but you've got some other models that are also supported there that weren't supported before. Um, and we also have some better visibility that's in place today and coming for ASPs and CMPs. So those two categories of folks in the ecosystem, uh, when there are problems with campaigns, it doesn't uh, benefit us to be able to not understand what's, what's been filed, who the brand is and what's being blocked. So we, there does need to be a level of privacy. So um, we don't see things we don't need to see, but there is a level of accountability with the carriers that they expect us all to be able to see what's happening and transpiring. So if you've got obviously content, comp, content that's obviously not permitted, disallowed, that we go in there and intervene. So that's some of the improvements that are happening with TCR to allow all the DCAs and, and folks in that, in that mechanism to be able to do that. Um, also increased throughput uh, is going to be granted, uh, I'm told. Um, by uh, at least one tier one for political campaigns. And uh, what we're being told is um, um, very high, if not unlimited throughput. So what this says really is, look, it behooves you to get registered uh, with 10 DLC because now, you know, that's something that typically is not granted to just everybody out there. So having the highest throughput available on tier ones to support political campaigns is a really big win uh, in this space, and, and it's there to be able to support these campaigns uh, as we look to further in the year. Um, so some other statistics, uh, campaign verify, I'm hearing it's uh, roughly or, or a, a little bit above 70% state and local verified, verified um, services, 30% are federal. So um, that gets us to the 100% number, but still state and local or majority of those campaigns are there. Um, high 90s for verification overall. And um, I think it was mentioned, I'm not sure, but CV is also available to send those pin codes over SMS. So we gotta, we gotta eat what we sell, right? So we got that benefits avail available today. Um, so some of the things that we're seeing some troubles with, uh, we still have issues with filtering. The folks in the industry that aren't, aren't aware of like using uh, public URL shorteners. So that's a challenge all the time, just to make sure that everyone knows if you do have those out there, they're still filtered. 
or untrusted, if you register a domain and it's available in Whois, then those messages pass without an issue. Um, we're also seeing a significant uptick in, um, in set zeros from the carriers. Uh, on, on short code, really, really short code in 10 digit senders. There's a, um, there's a new um, classification in WMC who manages uh, the audits for um, uh, unsolicited messages. And basically this is where uh, a, a number, 10 digit or otherwise, trends high with reported issues. And uh, you, you can have your traffic blocked it certainly flags to all the carriers as a problem. And I think these are mechanisms that are, I, I think just the awareness here is these are mechanisms coming into place that uh, everybody has some insight into who's getting in trouble out there. So it requires, um, at Cinch, we require an RCA. We wanna move this back to uh, a live state. So we wanna get these resolved quickly, but really that's, that's the issue. If people report these, these uh, campaigns as having problems, we all have a responsibility to react in the in the in the, in the ecosystem uh, to address it. Um, and then last, there's some there's some um, serious infractions for short code as well. Like this is a 10 DLC call, but I think people should be aware that it's it's not 10 DLC doesn't have all the heat here. It's across all centers, and they really want to see that if you if you're if you're operating above the board, things are okay. But if if it's a short code, a TFN, or a 10 DLC, and you've got some open complaints. Um, then, then the carriers do have, uh, in some cases, a third strike policy, which means it's game over after you've come across their desk uh, three times. And some of these are resulting in penalties and, and fines for the folks that are just blatantly ignoring it. So uh, hopefully that's a good update. Is there anything I missed, Josh, that you want me to cover? Um, I think that, uh, I think you covered quite a bit actually, and appreciate that. And there's probably a few other things that we'd love to get your opinion on as the call goes on, uh, Jonathan, but, uh, great points. And thanks for that, uh, that awesome update. Uh, there's a few things that I learned, so I appreciate that. Um, and, um, I'm going to pass this over to Clara in just a second, but if you do have any questions on this process or any issues that you see coming up or anything you need to clarify, just, um, just put it down in the Q&A section of the call, and we're going to be moving over to that uh, shortly. Um, I'd like to pass this over to Zachary at Clara. Zachary, could you just let us know how Clara's approached the 10 DLC rollout and how the process has been going so far for Clara and of course anything else that you're seeing out there. We know that you work with um, you work with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, CSPs as well as you have a lot of um, a lot of clients in the political um, area as well. Yeah, Jonathan and Stephanie did a great job in highlighting a lot of the, the same challenges I think we, we all see uh, as aggregators. You know, the things that come up, you know, quite often for us is really understanding uh, the vetting process, for example, with some of the some of the carriers and, you know, what the throughputs limits are, how can we get special business reviews to get a uh, higher level of throughputs and what does that process look like and is it consistent for everyone? Um, you know, looking at um, polling and why some carriers are, you know, more open to it than others and what what's going on with that and how can we move towards um, you know allowing more organizations to get some of their their polling out there without issues of being being blocked or, or having those sort of problems so we've been working with um, the carriers and addressing some of that stuff as well um, you know some of the conflicts that are coming up also between like multiple CSPs registering for the same campaigns and how do we address that and and you know um, what what's going on with the carriers in terms of timelines to make sure that um, those sort of things are being addressed in the primaries and general election coming up here um, in November. So um, one of the points that you have mentioned earlier around um, you know the cost for the FedEx. I actually had a call about this yesterday. So just for your audience, it's um, it's twenty nine dollars for via FedEx for you to be able to do that. So um, I just thought that that might be worth noting. So. Um, you know, I guess one of the other points that, that wasn't mentioned, too, is also, um, you know, slightly off base from political, but just some of the difficulties of getting some 
um, 501c3s vetted that may not necessarily be involved in political activities, right? And so what are we, what are we doing to support them? If they don't have an EIN, then um, can, can we leverage a determination letter, for example, if they have that available? So, um, you know, it's really just providing a lot of education to our clients, getting the feedback from the carriers around specific challenges. And I'm sure the other folks on this call are hearing this sort of stuff as well. And um, you know, just how they're managing it. So, um, you know, we've been going full bore and, and the, the problems your other speakers have mentioned are certainly things that we have come across as well. And, um, you know, these are just some of the other sort of points I thought maybe worth highlighting for your audience. Great, I appreciate that. And um, I'm sure that we'll be able to call upon you um, during, um, during kind of our question and answer. Um, session, uh, Zachary, and also if there's anything um, that comes up that you want to just, um, you, you want to comment on, let us know as well. We're going to uh, start taking questions from our audience. And like I just mentioned to uh, Zachary from Clara, um, in terms of our panelists, it's pretty, pretty casual. Um, if there is um, something you want to weigh in on, or if you want to take a lead on any of these questions, let us know. Otherwise, I'll just uh, select somebody. Um, if you have any questions at all, just put them in the chat box. Of course, we've received quite a few questions submitted at our 10DLC at purely.com um, email address. So we, we do have quite a few questions to get through, but uh, we'll get through as many of them as we can, as we always do. I'm going to introduce our question moderator, uh, Eric, uh, and Eric can get uh, our question started for us. First uh, question submission is as follows. Even with the CV token, some 10 DLC approvals are taking over 48 hours to come through. Is there anything being done to speed up this process? Okay, yeah, no, that's, uh, that, that's a good question. Maybe what we could do is um, pass this over, um, just hear what Cinch is doing over with, uh, with, uh, with Jonathan, maybe have Dan weigh in on this. Well, we're not seeing that. So I <laughs> probably have to ask Dan about that. Um, we haven't seen any issues with CB tokens being delayed. Dan? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it, there's, there's two parts of it. There's um, the, the, the application process and knowing you need to go to CV and actually go through it uh, and then waiting for the token to come in. But once you get the token and it's, it's sent into our system, uh, you should be ready to roll and ready to, to message for fully registered in a, in a matter of moments once you have the token in hand. Okay, great. Um, and um, that question is, um, uh, were they, do you think they were meaning in terms of any type of delays with the CV token, like it's taking them a little bit of time to get it, Dan? Yeah, that could be. Um, there's also, there was some cases a few weeks ago where we were having problems with the uh with getting the the actual tcr campaign approved upstream um uh, that sounded like it was a, a, a just an outage for a couple of day period related to net number and that's that's solved now what are the common reasons why we're seeing campaign tokens being delayed is it just all based on information going in in the submission um the submission phase yeah, it's either it's either going to be uh, information related. They've put something wrong in the EIN doesn't match exactly. The address doesn't match exactly. Something related to that, or it's uh, it's it's one of it, one of the levels like a, a state or local level where the the verification it becomes a very very manual process. Like John from from Aegis was mentioning, where uh, in some cases they even have to phone uh, the local election board to confirm this information because it's not publicly online. Okay, uh, Zachary, are you seeing anything in terms of that or hearing anything from any of your clients in terms of any delays on CB tokens? No, our, our process has been been pretty efficient. Yeah. Um, you know, we've been fortunate, similar to as Jonathan had said, it's, it's been working pretty smoothly for us. Okay, uh, great. Um, Eric, can we have our next question? Up next, another question submission is, what is the difference between campaign registry and campaign verify and who needs to do each one? That's uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, Dan, do you want to clarify that for us? Sure. So uh, the, the campaign registry is the is the overarching registry for all organizations and companies. It's not unique to political 
they handle the registration of, of what are the entities that are sending messages across the entire 10 DOC ecosystem. Um, where campaign verify is a, is a verification source strictly for political. Uh, you go there, you input your campaign information, they give you a verification code that you give to us. So it's not that you do one or the other. If you're political, you're doing both in tandem. And as John was mentioning, there's, a, there's another avenue now that's, that's built in right into the campaign registry, but it's once again, it's a third party verification fundamentally. Great, thank you. Eric, next question. Up next, we have a submission from Sandy who asks, uh, nonprofits are stuck with really crappy trust scores and can only send 10, K 10,000 SMS per day to T-Mobile. Other carriers are fine. What are you recommending folks do? Okay, uh, Jonathan, do you want to weigh in on this? Sure. Yeah, so um, there. With if you have a uh, the lowest throughput campaign that's out there, you are not going to see the greatest um, uh, capabilities on a, on a single TN. So there are a couple of ways you can you can work around this. Uh, most uh, DCAs or CSPs, depending who you're partnered with, uh, will allow pooled numbers. You can have so many that are pooled before you actually have to go through the pooled number form. Uh, and that's a pretty significant uh, quantity that you can, you can have to, to basically utilize multiple numbers for the same campaign. Uh, then all, that, all of the other throughput pieces are all tied, tied to the, uh, the vetting score. So if you choose not to vet, then you are going to come in, unless you're a Russell 3000 company, where those are already, vetting is already included. You're gonna come in with uh, a score that's determined by previous history or lack thereof, what they can see. So uh, I, I don't wanna paraphrase it, but it's very similar. The vetting score is very similar to a credit check. And uh, we were one of the first ones to see this across the board with Aegis and WMC, and they're very comprehensive. We ran it on ourselves. We ran it on MBlock, CLX, Cinch. We tried it across both uh, the different vetting organizations. It comes up with a very detailed report on who you're doing business with. And that is, that is the categorization that the industry is using to qualify um, what they do or don't know about somebody that's in the space. And I've seen really robust scores come across from, from companies in some cases I was surprised because uh, I know they had some issues in the past. So I think if anything, it trends towards being more forgiving than less forgiving with the scores that you get. But if you don't go through either vetting or enhanced vetting, which is a, it's the flat fees are, are less than $100. Um, you don't really have a, a case to look for more throughput. Um, now back up again, because early on, we talked about political campaigns. If you go through the filing process uh, with, with um, some of these carriers, they're looking at giving a lot higher throughput uh, for political campaigns at default. So I think that's something to consider that in the future, we're just going to see this as a default mechanism um, for these campaigns by default. And uh, I think stay tuned to see if what where that adaptation falls with the other carriers, but that should cover a lot of that. So what it really means is you do need to register because if you're unregistered, they don't know anything about you and the carriers have the ability to squash those campaigns because there's no P flag set. And if there's high complaints there, then, then they have nothing else to do but filter. So I think that's the initiative that I see You've got a, there's a runway for political campaigns that simply doesn't exist for a lot of other large enterprise businesses today. What's the best advice that, uh, that you guys would give um, to get the best score right up front? What's the, what's the number one thing you're seeing uh, in terms of this, the, the registration errors or I guess mm -hmm. length of time? Uh, any advice there, Jonathan? Yeah, so majority of the problems have been with, with the EIN tax ID stuff not being mapped correctly. It's still problematic. And we provide links to like Edgar and all these other public sources where you can find it out, but it's still tough. And you've got businesses that, you know, Cinch has got like five business entities of our own <laughs> with the acquisition. So it is tricky to nail that down, but that's a challenge. If you provide messaging on behalf of another provider, uh, it really is the brand that's that's representing the message sender. So there's, of course, a risk if you say, I don't want to devout who's behind the messages. Well, then you're taking the risk of running that that campaign traffic. That's a general statement. Doesn't matter if you're in, in the political sphere, or marketing, or two-factor authentication. You know, there's got to be an accountability tied to it. So 
I think really it's it's the challenges we've seen have just been not having the right information up front. Yeah. And if you've got that stuff submitted, the only other downside is if you want an enhanced vet, it does take more time. It's about a week turnaround for that. And it's a relatively manual process, but they're very thorough. Dan, when, um, when all the information's in place, um, this process is fairly instantaneous, is it not? Yeah, I think the original question was around 501c3s and 4s. So in that, that particular situation, it's, it's you know, uh, during business hours, it's near instant. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, 501c4s need a little bit more time because there's some manual stuff that needs to be done on their, on their kind of vet vetting process. Um, but we usually see a score come back within a minute or two on, on most of 501c3s and 501c4s when the information's been entered correctly. When we have bad information, when something doesn't match, when address doesn't match, when EIN doesn't match, um, that adds days to the process. And it's definitely the, the largest slowdown point is, is incorrect or mismatching information. Stephanie, um, if uh, when a situation happens where, where you're you're not getting a you're not getting a match or having an issue. Um, what's the first step that you recommend these um, uh, the, the campaigns or um, clients of the CSPs to take? Um, to verify what they've actually entered. To Jonathan's point, a lot of times the information that they've entered doesn't match what is on file um, with the election committee. So pull it back, review it, make sure it's correct. Um, if, you know, if they're still uh, getting a low throughput or they're not happy with the response that they've gotten, then um, revetting is an option. Um, if that is, if that's not something that they want to pursue, then, um, you know, we just, we work with them to see what we can do to, to push it along and um, to correct whatever information is, um, is holding it up. Yeah, thanks. John? Oh, I think you're on mute there, John, still. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, may I add something? Yeah. Um, so sometimes, especially with some of the nonprofit organizations, um, you know, we're, we're looking for information that we can get from authoritative sources like IRS, for example. And it's a government data source, and government data sources have their vagaries. So sometimes uh, there are there are uh, pieces of information that are not available through automation from the government that we actually have to look manually to be able to find them. So if you are a C, uh, 501c3 or C4, you're getting a, a low score and, and you've been around for a while and you have, uh, you know, you have a, a decent size organization, that, that sort of information, you know, some, sometimes that doesn't come through properly from the IRS. So do feel free to file an appeal. Um, an appeal costs you nothing except maybe a little bit of time, but, but we have a person dedicated to handling just appeals. And uh, we typically answer appeals within a day. So we will take a look and see what other information is manually available. Um, and so a lot of times uh, there may be information, even though they, you know, IRS says, hey, nothing for that EIN. Um, when we go and do some manual searches, we can find more information about them, especially with regard to the size of the organization, the age of the organization, that sort of thing. And so uh, whether you get a zero or you get a 16 or something like that, if, it, if it's in the low end and you really, you know, you're properly registered and you know you have an IRS determination letter, uh, you know, give it a try. Um, I, I don't like to take on that extra work. That's We're, we're doing that for free, but it, it really is important. Um, you know, we want to make sure that everybody who is entitled to messaging gets the right entitlement. So uh, please do use that. Yeah, we appreciate that. Uh, Eric, back to you. Next, we have a question submission from Mark, who says, <clears throat> I'm a consultant for several campaigns. So I have a pin or the pin sent to the candidate and they sent, uh, send the pin to me. Then I request a token and it goes to them as well. Is this the best and only system? Uh, Dan, would you like to start with this? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's the that's the campaign verify system. Um, you know, you could I, I I don't know if I can necessarily speak to this, but I think you can, as the political consultant, run the campaign verify portion on behalf of your customer. Um, uh, you have to check with campaign verify if that's something that you can do. Um, 
the also there's the 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 new solution that's coming that is a couple steps lighter on that which was the one that that john from Aegis was talking about um where you get a pin code uh with a qr code your your candidate can just take a picture of that um type in the pin code and on the back end the csp such as purely will get notified that it's good to go uh, and that saves the copy and pasting of the token portion um john you're were, you're were waving that you wanted to add to that yes please so this this falls into the uh, matter of security mm -hmm. that is under government review and so we cannot send it we cannot send those pin codes to anybody but the candidate or the committee that's filing um it, it those are pretty tight security restrictions and in fact there is a you know that u.s senate committee is kind of auditing what our processes are so there's no way we can just send all those pins to uh you know to to the consultant we we have to send it directly to the committee or candidate okay great thanks eric next question uh the next question submission is is there any plan to make CV tokens usable across CSPs or make it easier to get multiple? Many clients use multiple CSPs and it is currently extremely awkward to try and sort that out. Who would like to? Uh... I'll, I'll take that one. Um, because again, what, what we're trying to do is make the processes, the key processes consistent and the security concerns consistent across CV and, and the TCR Aegis solution. Um, so yes, we recognize that that was just brought to our attention this week that there is a need for that. One of the security considerations is that um, the same token shouldn't be shared across different CSPs, but we've become aware that um, the, the campaign may need to operate through various CSPs. So we're putting, we have temporary measures in place right now, both CV and Aegis, to be able to issue multiple tokens uh, to the same organization that can then be separately shared with different CSPs. And I've also been made aware that in some cases there is a need for one CSP to have multiple tokens for that same campaign. So we are accommodating that right now through the existing process by backing out charges, basically making it unbillable when we see a duplication like that so that we can issue a, a new token. And then we're working on it, the technology piece of it that will allow that to happen. We have automated processes that are making sure all of the security considerations are taken into account. And, and we anticipate within a period of about four to six weeks to be able to make that deployment that will make it a, a more automated thing. But right now we, we are accommodating that. Great, uh, back to you, Eric. We have another question submission, and this one is, some local races, specifically judicial, apply for an EIN with a PO box to keep their address private, but PO boxes are not allowed for verification. Is there something else they should provide to show the correct info? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, John, do you, want to wait? do you want to take this one again? Sure. So the, the PO the address that we see, the address that is submitted as part of the verification uh, submission uh, through the camp, uh, through campaign registry or uh, through CV, um, that needs to match the address that is uh, filed with the electoral authority. If the the PO box is you know shows up the same in both places, um, we can send the pin letter by. Uh, USPS, first class mail. We cannot send it via FedEx because FedEx does not deliver to PO boxes or general delivery or anything like that. Or a um, there's there's something called a CMRA, which is a commercial mail receiving agency, like a you know post you know, mailboxes, et cetera, something like that. So there there are limitations that that imposes. Um, your your Best bet if your email matches, if the email that you submit matches the email that's in your electoral filing, um, and it is not something like a Gmail address or a Yahoo address, if it is an actual, you know, good solid um, email address, then you can receive the pin letter via email. Um, if if you have a Gmail address and you're a PO box, I'm sorry, your only option really is going to be USPS. And, and that really is a, it's an election security issue. But you can receive it at a PO box by a first class mail. Well, that's good to know. Uh, yeah, thanks for clarifying that, um, John. Uh, Eric, back to you. Next question submission is, 
do registered and verified political organizations run a higher risk of hitting the three strike threshold or does that three strike rule already get applied to unregistered unverified political traffic yeah that's a good question um zachary do you want to start with this well i know you know if you're running on gray routes you're gonna you're gonna end up in trouble sooner or later it's just not a good idea and they don't need three strikes to shut you down so reality is you do want to get registered. You do want to be transparent. You do want to share your information because if you do have a problem, you can show that you're going about things the right way and you're trying to do this correctly and you're trying to be transparent with the carriers. So uh, our recommendation is always to, to register. Um, if you're concerned about the sort of traffic you're putting out there or the sort of content you have in there, um, you know, it would appeal to your, your aggregator or your carrier relations person to speak with them and say, hey, this is coming down the pipeline. I want you to be mindful of it. The more proactive you are in these sort of situations, the better off you're going to be. Great. Thank you. Uh, Eric, back to you. Up next, we have a submission from Jim who asks, a vendor told us to use toll-free instead of 10 DLC since we don't need to register. Is that true? Yeah, um, I will, I'll pass this over to Dan. Sure. Um, so in the past, that has been true. Um, just recently, it was announced that, that toll free is is imposing uh, not the same, but a very, very similar registration and vetting process. Um, that's probably due to the recent acquisition of, of that ZipWhip went through. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be the same. Uh, the one thing I would keep in mind is, uh, you know, the 10 DLC process is is years in now um a lot of the hiccups have been worked out what what uh toll free is going through is going to be relatively new it might not be the speediest rollout that they have and uh and they are they are being quite strict on on getting the registration done fast so something to keep in mind if you're choosing to use it from a political point of view you know we always advocate that 10 dlc is a is a better approach for for politics it makes a more direct connection, um, you know, you're using local numbers to talk to your voters to, you know, get in touch with them. Uh, toll free can often have a more impersonal approach. Um, you know, it, I think it has a very good use in sort of the business setting, but maybe not so much in the, in the political space. Okay, uh, thank you, Dan. Um, next question, Eric. Next, we have a submission from Claire who asks, uh, will we be charged any fees or penalties now when sending messages? Good question. Um, Stephanie, could I pass this over to you? I guess I would need to know in what context you're asking. If it's unregistered, yes. Um, that's the context. Is, okay. is there um, fees on the unregistered uh, traffic or any fines or anything? Yes, there are. Also, maybe you could also elaborate. I mean, um, this is something that, uh, are we starting to see these fees imposed yet? Or is this something that we're, we're imagining is coming down very soon? No, we're already starting to see yeah. um, fees associated with unregistered traffic. Okay, great. Uh, Eric, back to you. We have a submission from Sam who asks, uh, we read that EIN is not needed for all uh, for small campaigns. How do we register without an EIN? Um, Jonathan, would you like to weigh in on this? Sure. Um, there is a, a qualification called sole proprietor that's out there where you don't have to have the same level of details, but again, you're coming in with the, the lowest throughput that's available. So um, there's that. There's, of course, a, a test campaign. Uh, most aggregators have or CSPs have a mechanism where you can test, but again, uh, without without some, some form of verification on, the, on, uh, on your campaign, you're going to have the lowest throughput that's available. Okay, yes. Um, Eric, back to you. Up next, we have a submission from Larry who asks, our links in text messages often lead to being flagged as spam. Is there some way we can get an exemption? Uh, Stephanie, could I pass that to you? Um, so there's a lot of direction from the carriers regarding what type of URL shorteners are acceptable and which ones are not. Um, I think that information is, is readily available. If, if one of your URLs are getting um, caught in spam filters, I'd like to see what that is so that we could give direction specifically on what is being sent. But um, I'm sure 
any one of us could provide you with a list of acceptable URL shorteners and also a list of unacceptable URL shorteners. Okay, great. Hey, Josh. I know, sorry, go ahead. Also, I'd like to add that, you know, it's not just URLs. It's, um, it's also carrier received 7726 reports. Mm -hmm. So True. everybody out there, you know, you've got, you got the power in your hands as a consumer to say, this is unwanted. So right. when those trend high, the, uh, the carriers will either block that themselves or they'll reach out to the DCA like bandwidth or cinch to, to have us action it. Great. And I know, um, I, I mean, uh, just like that, we've, uh, you know, Time is going by so fast on these. There's so many questions. If it's okay with you guys, we'll just rifle through a couple of more. There, we have a lot of good questions still waiting. So uh, I'll pass it back over to you, Eric, but um, uh, we can get a couple more quick questions in. Up next, we have a question from Nancy who asks, my 501c4 was registered recently and there is a backlog at the IRS processing the registrations for nonprofits. We don't have a letter of determination yet. What do we do? John? Sure. Uh, so we have, I, I think we talked about it in last month's uh, session. There are forms that uh, are associated with the submission. Um, and, and depending upon the, the exact way that you're filing, uh, you can provide copies of those forms in an appeal. And we will consider those. And as long as they're, they're acceptable and, and um, I'm trying to really quickly pull up what those forms are, but basically it's the submission form that you say that, uh, that, that you send to the IRS, and I believe it's an online submission. It's something like 8976 or something like that, and then there's a companion form if, if you intend to get a determination. And if you provide those forms to us, uh, we, we, are, we have authorization from the carriers to accept that uh, to certify you as a 501c4. Um, and then the other thing that, that we find even more helpful is often when you send that form in, even though it's not a determination, ter determination letter, the IRS will send you a letter confirming that they received your form. That also is acceptable. And um, Zachary, um, uh, Zachary from Clara um, had to, um, had to uh, um, exit uh, for a prior engagement, but he had just uh, posted before he left um, appeals at uh, agusmobile.com. Would that be an email that uh, that they would use? Yes. Okay. So that's appeals at Agus Mobile. Yeah. T t typically, we we receive those from the CSP. Um, typically, the CSP is representing their clients in in filing the appeal, um, and and that's that that's the path to take. Great. Okay, guys. So, uh, well, can we get one more question, Eric? We have a question from Paul who asks: Will we be able to use branded link shorteners now? Okay, good question, um, Dan. Yeah, as, as Jonathan was saying earlier, um, yes, uh, you know, branded link shorteners have always been allowed. Um, it's it's the it's the public it's the URL problem. shorteners that are the the big problem. So your tiny URLs, your Bitlies, anything like that, that's what we have to stay away from. If you have a a link shortening system that's built into your own campaign's website, um, that's fine. You know. You know, purely does a review on all these messages. There's a, a deliverability check, and we we look for these type of things. If you're using something that's going to be causing problems, our team's going to flag that to you. Great. Okay, uh, one more question, Eric. We have a question from Monica who says, "Can we be rejected when we register, and what do we do if we get rejected?" I think we. Well, I guess we. Uh, I'll start off with Jonathan on this, but uh, I think we've we've talked a little bit about this already. Um, I haven't seen any rejections for a campaign. One, one form or another, you're going to come through. Uh, you can come through as a sole proprietor. Um, what you can have is a campaign that is suspended or blocked on one or more carriers. And if that is the case, if, um, if the carrier reviews um, an RCA from, from your partner, whoever you submitted it with, and they still feel it falls short, then the campaign can remain suspended. Um, and then you have an alternative to always refile you can bring the campaign up again, um, go through the approval process, which is nearly instantaneous, and, and have it reactivated. But uh, if it's already been flagged, the carriers do have spam filters and firewalls where they'll look for the same content uh, again. Um, so I think that the risk there is if you, if you, if you get, um, if I haven't seen it, but there, I'm sure there's a possibility for you to get into trouble where you can't come back and um, the door gets closed on you. Maybe 
TCR can answer that a little better if they've seen it in statistics, but, but we have yet to see it here at Cinch. Okay, uh, great. Well, I have to uh, I have to extend a, a big thank you to our our panels uh, our panelists today. Uh, John from Aegis Mobile, Jonathan, of course at Singe, Stephanie at Bandwidth, Zachary at Calera, and of course Dan from Purely. We really appreciate your time. Uh, Stefan ended up sending uh, regrets; he wasn't able to make it. Of course, he's been with us um, on a series of these uh, these calls. Um, but something had come up last minute. Um, if there is any uh, any questions specifically for the campaign registry that we haven't gotten to yet, we're going to send a send a text or send a message over to uh, Stefan and get you that answer. Um, also, all of our participants today, we really appreciate it. We know that there's still a number of questions. We just don't have time to get to them all. Um, right now. However, uh, we will do our best to get back to you and get the questions answered. We'll also post the uh, the video for anyone that's missed this um, on, um, you know, over on our purely um, YouTube and, and Facebook. So you'll be able to check that uh, in the next day or so. And if there's any questions we haven't gotten to or anything else that comes up, let us know. If we don't know the answer, we will send uh, a text over to Jonathan or to John or uh, to Clara, we'll get you the answer one way or another. So you'll be redirected right after um, right after this call ends. And then from there, uh, you'll be able to book a call with a member of our team if there's anything else we can do to help you or uh, anything along those lines. So we appreciate everyone spending the hour with us and thank you very much to our panelists. We hope that everybody has an amazing afternoon. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.